All right, we're going to talk here uh, about the uh, Nibbletronic. Um, I have here this uh, brave guy, uh, C-Trap, called since today. <laughs> He's an electronic engineer and is really into um, the fascinating thing of uh, using, using uh, media controllers and playing with it. He makes musical uh, instruments and uh, He's going to show you how to get there. Um, unfortunately, um, the musician is ill today. So I don't know, maybe we have to call someone from the audience to help him out to play some music <laughs> afterwards. But this guy will show it all. You all right? Yep. Thank you. Let's light the fuse then. <laughs> OK. Um, first, hello. I'm a bit nervous, but happy to be here. Um, I want to ask you to ask your questions as they arise, so you can keep track of what is going on. And yeah, then <clears throat> this is what it uh, will be about. I will tell you uh, what I did with this device. Then I will tell you what others did before me. And um, then we want to discuss if you should do the same. Um, as it is traditional, I start with the finished product. Um, what we have here is the, the current state of the Nibbetronic. I should get rid of the paper. Um, we see the mouthpiece at the left. Um, then there are then there's a pressure sensor. It is connected with a split PVC hose. Uh, there are four uh, micro switches. Um, right next to the microcontroller board you see there. And then we have a joystick and two more sliders. On the underside there is a, another slider and a MIDI jack. I completely lost track of shit. Um, this is the previous version and I will use it to illustrate the working principle. Um, as you can see it had quite a lot of more, no more, uh, lot more buttons and it could only play around 11 notes, one for each button and, and another one for no button press. The working principle is that you have this mouthpiece, the split hose, which allows you to blow through so it feels like, like a traditional um, instrument. Um, you put your fingers on the button and play it like a flute. The pressure sensor either triggers a note if none has been played before or controls the volume of the synthesizer, so you can have a volume envelope for every node, like a wind instrument does. The buttons define which node is played or trigger another node when you change your finger placement. Mm. 11 nodes aren't that many, so I decided to use fewer buttons to play more nodes. And the five of the left hand then were used to encode five bits. So using these five buttons, you can then count a binary up to 31. This worked. You have great tonal range. You can play four full octaves with that um, if you <coughs> omit the semitones. But it is a bit hard to memorize 32 distinct finger placement. Nobody wants to do that. And so I came up with a more ergonomic control scheme. Where's the next button here? Screw that. Um, yeah. Using only five buttons, you can ditch one more because that one was for the thumb and was kind of hard to play. It became a thumb rest. Um, I then added two buttons for, from the right hand, and that way um, was able to encode 60 nodes and with the right hand up to four octaves, which was actually, it became playable. You only had to remember um, 12 finger placements and you could, uh, you, you started to play semitone, so you had the full tone range of four octaves, which is quite something. Remembering finger settings 
is better than 32, but not yet ideal. And having 16 numbers available for just 12 nodes that we that I needed. Um, then the final refinement, I decided to assign um, the full nodes to the even numbers and the semitones to the uneven ones. Um, that way you only have seven finger placements left and that actually was manageable and has been played last year on this conference. Not by me, I never learned to do this. Um, this is the resulting control scheme and this is implemented in the current version. And you see you play with actually only three, fi three fingers and have the pinky left as modifier for semitones. Um, this works. It still has a lot of unused buttons and has the slight problem that it is pain in the ass to manufacture. Uh, all this brass rods and threadings and um, putting it okay, it takes ages. It was kind of unergonomic. There were tons of cables. Um, so time for the next iteration. And this is that, that what came from that. Um, on the other side, <clears throat> we have the four buttons for the nodes and a joystick for pitch band and modulation as I, somehow they showed up on synthesizers and never went away, so I thought I'd go with that. And <clears throat> two sliders for whatever. You can assign some continuous controller to that and adjust your sound and whatever you do with the MIDI controller. Um, on the lower side we have now a slider, um, the slider next to the pressure sensor um, is used to encode the octaves and the whole range is, is mapped to just four. Um, if you want more octaves you can program them in, you can actually solve this in software which is nice uh, but um, it becomes hard to find your octaves <laughs> that way after some time. Um, and we have a battery as a power supply, so fewer cables now. Mm, I'm missing the next button. Problem is, nothing of what I did is actually really new, as I found out. And there's tons of prior art out there, um, especially in the comment section, uh, comment section of the Gordophone blog, you find lots of people asking about asking questions for their own bills. So there are really, really a lot of uh, EWIs out there. Um, as I said, instructables. This is the wireless Gordophone. Um, some build I found. This one is, uh, is interesting. Um, it, is, it is a device by Nia Steiner who started to design these things in the 60s and built the first ones in the 70s. Um, and then actually designed the one big commercially available product from Archive. This, this is a Naya Stina design, so there's actually one person doing all this thing out there. Um, there are a lot of builds. These things are available and I have never witnessed one being used in some kind of performance. So they exist and nobody uses them, which was kind of a mystery to me. Um, so there are the reasons why these things exist. There are a lot of practical reasons, there are artistic reasons. You can control not just synthesizers, you can control your light show and this might make sense in some settings. But the really big advantage of EWIs is that while traditional instruments uh, have an interface that is mostly defined by the underlying physics. With an electronic device you can do what you want. You, you have no such constraints and you can build an instrument for somebody who has maybe a non-standard number of fingers or hands. Um, another idea would be to ditch the breath control completely, replace it with a foot pedal and you can build a wind instrument that somebody with 
a weakened lung or some other problems can actually play. So there, <clears throat> there is the main reason to design these things, um, to build instruments that otherwise, uh, for people that otherwise couldn't, couldn't play an instrument. Um, as an example, I have the sketch of an EWI for a Tyrannosaurus Rex with a very long neck, reinforced steel mouthpiece, um, reinforced claw pads, and uh, another bend control input that allows the T-Rex with his poor fine motor skills to actually play this thing. Another good reason to build those is to understand what's there. Uh, what we have here is the device that is built by Akai and in the circle um, there's a set of metal rollers and they are opposite of the um, left hand finger pad. They react to touch, they can be moved but they don't detect movement and I've seen this and I didn't understand why somebody would build such an interface. And then I built this. We have a question. Oh, thank you. So if you're really interested, I own this device and I know how to play it. And if you, if you know how to play a saxophone, it's completely obvious why you want to build it that way. I understood it later because um, this is the only wind instrument that I actually own and I can't play it, um, which is a shame. I'm planning to learn it since two years or so. Um, Excuse me, are there saxophone players here in the room? <laughs> ah. Maybe maybe they can help you uh, <clears throat> with that. I, I actually figured it out because this setup with the octave selection opposite um, of the left hand fingers doesn't work so well. Um, you're pushing on the slider um, and at the same time pushing against your fingers so you can't play notes that require you to release all your fingers. And you're just pushing the instrument out of your mouth and um, that may be a comedic element, but it doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, this could be mitigated in several ways with a neck strap like many traditional instruments have. Um, but in the end, I found out that these rollers at the archive are actually used for a tape selection. So no real new idea, idea there. And because they react to touch, you don't really have to push against your fingers. You can move your left hand fingers completely independent from your thumb. And because this, these rollers, um, they give you really good feedback where your thumb is, much better than the mechanical slider. So yeah, by building my own device, I kind of imitated accidentally um, the big one by Arkai and got to understand why they did what they did, how they came to these conclusions, and I got a really nice understanding about electronic wind instruments. So this is another good reason why you might want to build such a device. Yeah, come on. Um, yeah. If you thought you would see something revolutionary here, they exist since the 60s. Um, they make sense. Uh, if you have a T-Rex in your life who wants to play a wind instrument, now you can build one for him. Um, and you probably should if you want to understand um, these devices. They pose some interesting software problems. Um, you don't want to spam your synthesizer, but you want to have continuous breath control the whole time, and you have to balance that out. Um, the, sensor day, the sensor is not quite straightforward, and there are a lot of interesting problems to solve there. Um, if you don't want to start from scratch, uh, here are the links, and 
the God of page is, is great. There are several builds, several different control schemes. And there is a lot of theory in there, lots of source code and lots of solutions. Um, at Patchman, um, there's the historical reference. There are the devices of Nyastina and some other exotic builds. Um, the Hopkins electronic aerophone is actually wireless, which might be interesting to build if you're into that. And of course, we have the Nibletronic, which you have seen here and several pictures. So, thank you very much. I have the, I'm under the impression that I've been quite fast uh, this time. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of as relieved as you, and are there any questions? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, c -trap. <laughs> I think we all appreciated that you come over to speak about a nibble uh, instrument. <laughs> um, Actually, I can help you as well to point you to some saxophone players who play this Akai kind of devices. Are there people here among the audience who play this instrument? Uh, is there a possibility maybe to show as well the instruments because you have it here in your box? Uh, I, I actually brought it with me and the full bill of materials is, is, on, the, um, is on the page and uh, are some boards, which were, uh, you can't order less than six, so. So? And I, and I don't, I don't want to found an orchestra, so, yeah. Not yet, but there are um, um, enough people here to make that kind of band, I presume. Uh, is, is this functional? Is this, is this, can we test it without um, having damages? Not right now, the firmware is kind of borked, Currently, um, I, I came here to to uh, de finish the development and to work on the next iteration because, as I said, this solution for octave selection is less than ideal. Probably there are some probably there are some people who can help you do, with that. Uh, are there? I, I thought that that maybe some some people around here might know something about building hardware. I'm I'm not sure, but um, I, I'm I don't see any hands yet. <laughs> Um, no one? There. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we found one. Second. <laughs> Very nice. Um, okay, there are questions, I presume. Um, is here from the internet? Uh, yes, uh, the question is, why did you choose a non-canonical setup for the finger buttons? Uh, Non-what? Excuse me, can you repeat that, please? Why have you chosen a non-canonical setup for the finger buttons? Uh, I hated playing the recorder at school, and I wanted to go as far away as possible from that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we know that feeling, I presume. Is there another question somewhere here? In the, uh, maybe. Oh yeah, one second. Please take the microphone, sir. Playing the buttons. Yeah, uh, what exactly does the breath do? Is the, what does the pressure sensor do? Is it for volume or? Yeah, it, ah. it controls the, um, the channel volume. I think it's CC7 or something like that um, of the whole synthesizer. Um, so you can define um, your, your volume envelope for each node. Ah, okay, thank you. Right, and someone else? Uh, question? There are four mics here. Someone on the internet? Yes, there, please, sir. Please take the mic. So, if you want to see somebody who's really good at it playing the Archive AV, you go to YouTube and Google uh, and search for Original Rays by Michael Brecker, and then you see a superb Richard. 15 minutes of. Pardon? Richard. Original, original Rays okay. original. played by Michael Brecker and his band. Okay. Um, uh, Thank you. No. Thank you. <laughs> um, no one else here with a suggestion? Uh, is there a band uh, that can be now assembled here in the back? No? <laughs> but thank you very much once again.
Thank you, C-Trap, for this fantastic presentation. Uh,